So now let's segue to our, our next panel discussion. Um, Annie and Paul, if you want to take your, your places. Um, Annie Lowry, uh, as all of you who were here earlier in the morning know, um, is the business and economics uh, writer for Slate Magazine, uh, soon to be joining the New York Times and uh, having a very busy week for many other reasons as well. But Annie, I'll just hand it off to you uh, again without embarrassing you further. I'll set. So uh, yeah, in this segment we're going to talk about a, a view of the energy industry from the view of uh, Wall Street. And so I'm here with Paul Sankey, who is uh, an analyst for Deutsche Bank. And so um, I'm going to do a little bit of a no-no for panels and start off with a little bit of an exposition about some of the things that, that Deutsche Bank has been um, analyzing recently. And, and so recently they've been telling, and please interrupt me if I get this horrifically wrong, <laughs> but they've been telling uh, the folks who, who uh, pay them for their good wisdom that they see uh, peak oil happening a little bit sooner than some other folks do, um, you know, in the next sort of 10 years, and that what might happen is that uh, underinvestment is going to lead to a supply crunch. That supply crunch is going to speed up the process in which electric vehicles become much more common. Uh, electric vehicles will be disruptive, and uh, this will lead to supply and demand trailing off in tandem somewhat sooner than, than uh, other folks see it happening. So is that is <laughs> basically well, it's, it kind of the is. shape? I mean, we don't talk about peak oil in, as a, from a supply point of view, from a geology point of view. We talk about it from a geopolitical point of view. So sure. the, the problem is that conventional oil is essentially co uh, concentrating into the hands of lunatics and, and other uh, you know, difficult to deal with people mm -hmm. um, who essentially view um, investment in oil as something that's done by other people for their benefit to take rent out of the oil industry to uh, either, either spend on Ferraris or, you know, in the case of a Chavez, spend on social programs or or you know, roads or schools or whatever they spend it on, they don't tend to view it as a reinvestment process. And that's how the underinvestment starts. Mm -hmm. So in certain places, there is the opposite uh, to peak oil going on. Obviously, in the US, where you have a, an open, so far, investment climate, high oil prices have generated a new resurgence in supply, as you all know. Mm -hmm. And that you know, there's room for hope there. But, but the, the reality is that the, the majority of the world's remaining oil is now in uh, the hands of uh, essentially of OPEC Islamic or socialist governments. So of the top, or eighty percent of the world's remaining conventional oil, it, you know, is now in the top ten. Top ten uh, reserves holders are all either OPEC, uh, Islamic, or socialist, and and that means that that whole underinvestment theme is very important, and that's where we see the peak on the supply side. Mm -hmm. And so talk to me a little bit about the demand side as well, because you see a transition to electric vehicles happening much faster than we actually had a panel earlier this morning about cars, uh, in which we had some folks from the auto industry saying that they think that this will happen slowly. In 2020, we are probably all going to be in the same type of cars that we're in now if there are some changes to fuel economy. Um, but y you see it happening faster, and you use actually the word disruptive, um, or maybe that's well, just been applied to Well, disruptive simply comes from the idea that once you drive a more efficient car, you're not going to go back to a less efficient car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of digital camera type example. Uh, film has got uh, cheap and developing film has got very cheap, but nobody goes back because sure. it's just a better product, basically. Uh, that's the disruptive. There's also the asymmetric elasticity, which you found in the 70s with oil, which is where the price gets very high. You substitute the oil out of um, power generation and out of industry. That's relatively easy to do. Even though oil prices then go very low, you never put it back in. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for it to be substituted and worked out. The problem is that asymmetric elasticity means that you also get harder and harder to substitute over time. Mm -hmm. So you're now going after one of the, the single most difficult things to substitute, which is, is gasoline, cheap, relatively cheap gasoline in relatively cheap cars, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's somewhat tough. The, the overall view is that the, uh, the average U.S. citizen, regardless of um, you know, whether they describe themselves as an environmentalist or not, uses 20 barrels of oil per head per year. So that's the average in the US. Europe uses 10. Uh, China uses 2. The Middle East uses 10, which is crucial. OPEC uses 10. So, so there's pressure on the oil supply from the demand side in these countries as well. And obviously, you can see that the potential for efficiency gains in the US is enormous. Mm 
It's also the last major market or the major market where the price is low tax and relatively free market because you've got these governments interfering in places like China and the Middle East. Europe, the gasoline price is 10 bucks a gallon. There's not much very far to go there. I mean, they're using half the oil per capita. We firmly believe then that as the pressure from China and the Middle East continues, as the supply side fails to react because of what I said to you about mm -hmm. who's got the remaining oil, uh, so what you do is you drive the price of oil to the point at which American, Americans change their behavior. Right. Because again and again, Americans have elected to, uh, to purchase heavier cars, to purchase bigger cars, to purchase less fuel. And I know that we've seen this change a little bit recently. But for a long time, it, it was that you would predict that people would have smaller cars. In fact, they keep on buying bigger and bigger ones. And so do you think that what will happen is essentially the price of oil will get so much that it will really change the, the auto consumer's behavior? Totally. And I don't think there's anything you know, stupid or egregious about people driving very big, luxurious cars. Mm -hmm. uh, it's simply a function of very cheap gasoline. So you've had mm -hmm. gasoline in the U.S. at a dollar a gallon, you know, for as long as we did. And then just about two dollars a gallon, especially relative to income, it just wasn't a big deal. It was the last of your concerns was the price of gasoline. And if we had allowed, frankly, Exxon to continue investing in places like Venezuela and, and Saudi, where it used to be, what you'd find is that we'd have loads of oil and it would be priced at like 20 or $30 a barrel. But in the event, as I said, as governments have taken over, they've screwed it all up. And by the way, this is a huge issue for us as we view uh, alternative energy going forward because it's, it's essentially dependent at this stage on governments. And governments, as you probably have guessed from a guy coming from Wall Street, are basically um, now our big problem in terms of very high indebtedness and in terms of their competence to deal with the, the issues that we face. We're, we're really questioning that, quite frankly, which is why all your alternative energy stocks have been so hard hit recently uh, on the stock market. We've just mm -hmm. lost all confidence in, in future subsidy of any kind. Anyway, going back to, to, to what we were saying about uh, choice of car and efficiency, um, what you're doing is almost exactly bouncing the price of oil up at the point where U.S. assistance changed their behavior, which is around, at this stage, $4 a gallon, which equates to around $120 a barrel of, of Brent oil. And that's exactly where you're bouncing. So you're bouncing at the point where there's behavior change. The issue is that it takes, the cars are available if you want to buy one. It does cost a lot more. The economics just about begin to work at four. Certainly at $5 a gallon, the average driver would choose a Prius. Uh, as a car that would economically make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a 12,000 mile a year driver. A 100,000 mile a year driver, like a taxi driver, should, would have already, I think, I didn't, my cab here was not uh, a hybrid, but every cab in New York City is now a hybrid by, uh, actually by Bloomberg's um, mandate. But uh, you know, they should all be driving sure. hybrids. The, the issue is it takes 12 years to rotate the fleet for the average driver. So it's, mm -hmm. we are, we're at the peak point, but we're at a, at a kind of a decade long peak point uh, from which we think U.S. gasoline demand is actually going to collapse. Okay. And so talk to me a little bit about emerging economies and so Asia. And obviously, they're going to be a bigger part of the demand story, and, and they're going to be a bigger part of the consumer story going forward. So how do you see uh, your Chinese citizen who all of a sudden is pretty capable of purchasing a car 10 years from now and, and the tens of millions who will, what's affecting their consumer behavior? Well, the, the interesting, I guess, number there is that Typically, there's been a relationship of about $5,000 per year of per capita income and car ownership. You actually have a direct takeoff. When people get to $5,000 per year, if we look back, keeping in mind that with developing economies, you can look at the US in the 1800s, uh, maybe early 1900s, and then you, know, you can get up to Japan in, in, in the 50s and Korea in the 70s and 80s. And now you can see that this $5,000 uh, per capita GDP is an inflection point for car ownership. Right now, there's 500 million Chinese about to flip over that level. OK, so this is not, this is, <laughs> it's a big number, obviously. Uh, additionally, speaking of disruptive technology, the Chinese have decided to leapfrog because they cannot compete in the conventional gasoline engine. They're too late to the party, straight into the next phase, which is hybrid and electric. And that's the way they're going to go. The slightly odd thing about Chinese behavior right now is that the, um, I guess it's not odd, but it's the way they're behaving, is that if you look at car ownership growth against gasoline growth, there's a disconnect because they're actually buying the cars but not driving them. Right now, they're literally, there's this uh, status symbol uh, effect that's going on. Um, but ultimately, as I said, that $500 million, excuse me, $500 million uh, threshold of people entering the middle class is, is a pretty incredible number mm -hmm. and one which is why we, we believe that there's so much pressure on the U.S. oil market because in order to make room for all that demand, even if it's more efficient demand, mm 
-hmm. you're going to have to get a lot more efficient here or, or wherever else people will stop oil, using oil first. Going back to the first principle, which is that the global oil market is near its peak uh, potential size. Mm -hmm. And so if you see this analysis as, as taking place over some time frame, and the real question is when, when certain things take place, when the price of gas reaches a point that American consumers really change their behavior, when it is that uh, those 500 million Chinese people actually become wealthy enough to purchase cars and drive them as opposed to just leaving them on the street. Um, what are some things that are going to slow this down? And why do you think that, what do you think makes, I guess, describe the timetable for when you see these, these major things happening? Well, the Chinese uh, you know, wealth creation is almost inexorable. So that, that's mm -hmm. pretty much, in our view, is going to happen. Um, the price of behavior change in the U.S. is occurring as we sit here. I mean, you're at, I mean, we've, we've come <laughs> off a little bit, but seasonally you'd, you'd expect oil and gasoline prices to fall a little bit outside summer. But we're absolutely pricing at the point where people will change their behavior. And they start by, by driving a bit less. And we're not talking about you know, the average working person. We're talking about teenagers. We're talking about f you know, lim uh, fixed income and so on. And so the behavior shift is, is occurring. Where could it change? Um, you know, on the supply side, uh, it's tough to see. We think there's a lot of pressure in Saudi Arabia, which obviously is, the central, is considered the central bank of oil. They've got a lot of domestic problems, a lot of need to satisfy their own population growth and, and local uh, issues. Our lines on this are, are along the lines of, I think there's 60 Saudi princes born every month. Um, they're building, um, you know, t I think 250,000 new houses to try and keep people quiet. But 65% uh, of college graduates in Saudi Arabia graduate in theology, of whom 60% are women who aren't allowed to drive cars, as it happens. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things there that make us think that Saudi is not sustainable, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so the supply side looks very worrying to us. The whole Arab Spring issue um, really is difficult to imagine where we get a big upsurge in supply. Where you look where things are happening positively, like in the U.S., uh, although there is a lot going on in unconventional and good growth from Canada, you've got to remember that there's also been a major slowdown in the Gulf of Mexico owing mm -hmm. to uh, the Maconda disaster. And on top of that, uh, the actual amounts that you're looking at here are relatively small in the global scheme of things. So, you know, you're talking about 100 or 200,000 barrels a day of oil supply growth in the U.S., which is great from the long-term trend, you know, and the reversal it represents. But it's really, a, you know, a rounding error in terms of Chinese demand growth, which is more like uh, 500,000 barrels a day per year. So you've got 200,000 of growth in the U.S. from one of the most positive areas of global oil. You're still not even getting close to what the Chinese are consuming incrementally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of areas where we could be wrong. I mean, Russia, I guess, is an area where you could see change. We could see change in Venezuela. But in the very near term, it's, it's difficult to believe that these trends aren't sort of inexorable. Mm -hmm. The one that's really tough for us and we can't value at all is this issue of governments and governments' indebtedness. That's what's terrifying Wall Street right now. Mm -hmm. The mood on Wall Street is very dark uh, and very concerned. We have no confidence uh, in governments to solve problems that we don't even know have. We don't have an idea to give them. You know, this is a, a, a problem of coming into a major recession with gigantic leverage. And now you've got a choice of do you delever and make the recession worse, mm -hmm. or do you just keep spending and try and solve a credit card problem with a credit card? Mm -hmm. Neither of them are good ideas. And so, you know, the backdrop here is really more important in many ways. Yeah. But explain a little bit how that relates to oil, because I think that for folks that don't think about this issue on a daily basis, it might not be clear why being in a Reinhardt Rogoff recession <laughs> is, is going to influence how quickly we adopt new technologies and, and how the energy markets play out globally. Yeah, well, I mean, we struggled with any kind of coherent energy policy out of Washington. I haven't been, I've been coming here for years. I haven't been able to identify one for many years. Um, the, uh, the, the conclusion, therefore, is that the market, this is why a lot of our talk is about what prices do to markets, because sure. we're assuming the government basically has no policy. And, um, you know, I, I think it's simply because you have such a, 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 a mishmash of conflicting infra, in, interests on a bipartisan basis in the negative sense. So, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest coal states that can be Democrat. You know, the, uh, the biggest oil states can be Democrat. Uh, the, 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 the more efficient states can be Republican. You know, it's, it's a tremendous m mix of potential conflicts of interest. Sure. And then uh, overriding all of that, you've got the, the, just the jobs issue. You know, this is the biggest single concern. So, so the, the com combination of the jobs and tax issue is then combined with the rhetoric and what uh, you'll have Lisa Marginelli up on the stage here a bit later on, a, a phrase I basically stole from her, which is the, uh, the conspiracy of ignorance about oil in the U.S., which is, is to do with the fact that consumers – 
really a somewhat ignorance of the truth of the global oil market, simply because the units are complicated and, you know, it's mm -hmm. tough to know how much a barrel of oil is relative to a gallon of oil and, and a gallon to a ton of coal and everything else. Uh, and how that relates to solar, which is a point the guy made just before, which was, you know, that the, the energy density issue is all quite confusing to consumers. Sure. They tend to have a knee-jerk uh, response to that. And that tends to be to blame, you know, to view the Saudis as the guy that bought you 911, as the guy that, 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 that is, is responsible for our oil dependence. As it happens, the U.S. is the least Middle Eastern oil dependent r major economy in the world. The Japanese are 85% Middle East oil dependent. We're only 10, mm -hmm. 10 or 15. But that doesn't change U.S. voters' perception. And U.S. voters then vote for rhetoric that supports the ignorant, uh, you know, the conspiracy of ignorance, mm -hmm. which, which exacerbates the lack of... Uh, which is a kind of a Washington half an hour answer for, for me saying that you know there is, there's nothing much to say, uh -huh. but um, it becomes. Uh, <laughs> it, it, sorry about that. I'll That's stop. Okay. Um, and what's the role of so obviously if you're an oil company you have an extraordinary vested interest in in keeping the oil markets somewhat. Or maybe I could be wrong about this even this first premise, but you have a vested interest in keeping in keeping the supply of oil stable. And so how, how, how do you think that they're going to be able to, if you see a, you know, a much more turbulent world going forward, do you think that big oil companies are going to be able to, to act where perhaps governments aren't going to be able to? No, no, the governments control the resource, and that's been the issue. So as I said to you, uh, Exxon might, might now, if let's say Hugo Chavez is, is very sick, you know, they may get another regime change. Exxon could be allowed back into Venezuela. That would be the third time they've entered Venezuela in the last 40 years. They've been nationalized twice. You know, presumably down the road they'll get nationalized again. Um, so it becomes very difficult, and that's part of the uh, underinvestment cycle because as these uh, governments tend to add volatility to oil and underinvestment, the oil companies are incentivized to invest at a conservative price. Mm -hmm. And so a key issue with global oil supply growth has been not only do the governments underinvest, but the companies underinvest. Mm -hmm. If they overinvest, they lose money. If they underinvest, they make more money. Um, you know, so basically that's to say that, let's say you, you plan on 60 and the oil co price comes in at 100, you win. You plan on 120 and it comes in at 100, you lose your job. Sure. So you know, there's a strong <laughs> interest in them being very conservative and that's what they've been. So if you look at our research, for example, pictures we can show you, really they've, 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 they've had almost no growth in oil production in the past 10 years, despite prices that have generated, everyone knows, Washington and the US consumers alike, vast profits. Mm -hmm. So they should arguably be reinvesting higher, but you can't force a company with shareholders to reinvest at a higher rate. That sure. just gets uh, kind of silly. Now, some companies have been very aggressive and they've won. And notably, all the US E&P companies that have gone after this US unconventional trend, and it's been a huge success. Um, what the government, what what the, the companies, not only oil but all energy companies, wants uh, wants is a stable, a stable environment. Because again, it's not just about Hugo Chavez. The the uncertainty around tax changes, it's a it's a standard joke amongst the companies I cover, such as an Exxon, or a Chevron, that the most risky uh, investment province, province by a mile globally of all the the ones they face, including Venezuela, Angola, you know, you name it, the most risky is the UK, and that's because the tax rate changes there the most often. Here again, you have a similar issue here in the U.S. where permitting, and this is the, partly the fault of BP, but you know, you've, you've had a, a lot of uncertainty in the regulatory environment, with, with, uh, particularly as regards tax. I think they can handle regulatory environment being tightened because of you know, an error or a terrible accident, but ultimately some sort of clarity and long-term ability to plan on tax would be, would be hugely helpful, but you kind of don't expect to get it. Sure. Um, so I think that you have that volatility is also adding to their conservatism. So th they would tell you they've got plenty of opportunities. One thing that we can say is that gas, natural gas, has a huge future. I think that's one of the mega trends where traditional oil and gas is clearly overlapping with alternative fuels. That's very much our view. Uh, it's a consensus view, but it's just so blatantly obvious that uh, you know it's, uh, it's something that's worth highlighting again and again. Yeah. So I think we have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Go ahead. Oops. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Chia Chen. Hey. Uh, will it be feasible for U.S. Uh, export car to China, Indian, and the uh, Arab world? Car or gas? Arab world. What, what to, to export cars? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the costs here are higher, higher uh, as a function of, of labor costs and, and raw material costs somewhat higher in the U.S., but the companies have been, I think it's the, the major achievement uh, unlauded of the uh, 
of the Obama administration was the application of much tougher um, vehicle fuel efficiency uh, requirements on, on the U.S. car industry and essentially the restructuring of the U.S. vehicle industry has been, to me, one of the great positives that was a necessary step that's been taken. And generally speaking, those, those uh, U.S. major car manufacturers are now uh, globally competitive, not least because of the weaker dollar. So in that respect, they can. But the question that I, I'm not a car analyst. The, the question uh, we get is whether or not you'll be able to export natural gas and, and oil, both of which essentially are very limited right now. But we have currently the cheapest natural gas and some of the cheapest oil in the world here. A lot of you would be aware that the spread between Brent crude and WTI, that's the US Western uh, Texas Intermediate uh, uh, Oklahoma grade um, crude, is, is $20 a barrel for two crudes that have the same calorific uh, qualities uh, and general qualities. And that's, that's a huge differential that tells you that we're onto something with U.S. unconventional oil and we should probably be exporting it. It would be hugely beneficial to the U.S. economy. My suspicion is that the knee jerk in Washington, as always, will be the wrong decision, which will be to prevent the export. And the same is occurring with natural gas. There's more pursuit of natural gas exports in Canada than there is in the U.S. Again, the wrong-headed idea that somehow it's detrimental to energy security to export this stuff. Uh, which would be, it, but which by contrast would be so positive for the U.S. economy. It's exactly what we need to do: is export more stuff and create more jobs. Okay. So I think we have time for one more, just very quickly. I, I just wanted to get uh, your opinion about um, Brazil as a as a new oil country, uh, our major oil country, and 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 also the investments of Petrobras in um, land and farmland in the in the. In the equatorial regions of the world, uh, to expand uh, uh, sugar, sugar cane derived uh, ethanol, and how that affects the <coughs> the game. <laughs> um, well, Brazil, the, the subsalt discoveries, which were previously broadly unknown because they're underneath salt, and that's very hard to see through using conventional oil industry technology. Of course, discovered vast amounts of contiguous uh, oil, which is not. It's diff different to what we've seen previously in deep water, where the reservoirs tend to be very fragmented and challenged. So this is a very uh, enormous discovery, a new, totally new play, the first that we've had in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the new millennium, and was clearly a massive story. Again, the, the problem goes back to the fact that uh, the government got involved, um, and we're really struggling with how to value the impact of the government on uh, Petrobras, on Petrobras's spending, and on Petrobras's development of that oil. Uh, Petrobras was the worst performing major oil stock in equity markets of 2010, and it's the worst performing stock year to date. So if you want the view from Wall Street, you can see that it's, and I'm talking about across all, pretty much all energy stocks. Last year, for instance, it performed worse than BP on stock markets, which give you an idea of how badly, uh, as you can imagine, BP didn't have a great year last year, um, to say the least. Uh, Petrobras actually went, the stock price went down more. That's because, again, what we really struggle with in energy in general is how do you value government and government behavior. Uh, another point I'd make is that the time frame of governments, this is vastly important in democracies where they have oil, the, the time frame of a major deep water oil field development is now probably 12 to 15 years. That means that you're in a situation where uh, you'll probably go through four or five U.S. administrations, maybe three or four U.S. administrations for every major oil field development, which is another reason why the companies plan so conservatively. Additionally, the government then, as with Petrobras, decides that it wants to get into local employment creation through requiring local content and building local refineries. And again, shareholders don't want them to do that. So, you know, the government's taking a government decision. The shareholders don't like that, which is why they sell the stock. On ethanol, you know, again, this has been interesting coming to Washington because the first time I came up here to speak about ethanol and energy to the Ways and Means Committee in a, in a testimony, they, the Republicans that asked me just politely asked me not to be rude about ethanol. And I said, well, I'm going to be rude about it because it's stupid. And uh, <laughs> within, within six months, literally within six months, it has been uh, 2007, ethanol had completely fallen out of favor and was, you know, deeply unfashionable. Um, and it probably should be when you're using subsidized corn, you know, to, uh, to, to make a subsidized fuel. It's just crazy. No subsidized fuel can ever be a long-term solution, which is another major challenge for alternative energy and new energy developers is just this basic principle that if it's subsidized, especially in today's government balance sheet situation, with the possible exception of it being subsidized by the Chinese, or maybe with the clear exception of it being subsidized by the Chinese or subsidized in the Middle East, no other major OECD government is now in the position to subsidize anything. They are bust. 
don't underestimate how bad our debt problems are, not least in the US, but also in Europe. So what we're doing is we're selling alternative energy stocks on the basis that the, the, the subsidies are going to have to go away, and that's what's scaring us so much. As you know, Brazilian bagasse uh, ethanol is actually globally competitive, so that should have a perfectly reasonable future, especially against all these biofuel uh, mandates that there are in the world. So I think a, a pretty good outlook for, for that particular ethanol because it's not subsidized. All other subsidized forms of energy, I think, are under deep, deep threat here. Um, so with that, we, we have to end this panel. Thank you so much uh, Thank you. Thank for you. coming. Thank you.